Tasnim? Yeah. Asma? Yeah. Russell? Yeah. Iklas? Yeah. Lily? Yeah. Shard? Yeah. Serene? Yeah. Nohela? Yeah. Sadia? Yeah. Sara? Yeah. Platin? Yeah. Saif? Yeah. Habiba? Yeah. Mahima? Yeah. Shazad? Yeah. Manas? Yeah. Leon? Yeah. Tringa? Yeah. Nida? Yeah. Heba? Yeah. Muna? Yeah. Julia? Yeah. Arnitz, yeah. Drin, yeah. Radisha, yeah. Ali, yeah. Yasmin, yeah. Issa. Yeah. Today we've got uh, Jeremy Della, who's going to be working with you on a project to do with art, culture and society and politics. So I'll just hand over to Jeremy. Thank you for having me here today. I just want to start by telling a, a story. It's really a fable about Britain that's seen through the eyes of a TV show in the UK called The Hitman and Her which was basically a record producer and a younger woman going around nightclubs in the late 80s and early 90s. He has an empire, basically. In 1988, he's probably the most successful record producer in Britain. He's selling millions and millions of records. And I'm going to show you a clip of it. Because inadvertently, or accidentally, it really documented life in Britain. It really documented the con conservatism of life in Britain as well at the time. And in these two clips, you'll see how the world changes between 1988 and 1992. Welcome to the Hitman and her. This is the Hitman. And this is her. And this is the tour of the night, the Black Hole. Yes, we're back in Blackpool. These clubs were not really about music, they were more about entertainment. So like something out of the 1950s, this is Britain as a holiday camp. Four years later, the program went to a club in Coventry and it was a totally different environment. And you can see that the presenters don't know what's happened. You might have noticed this isn't a normal Hitman and her. We're not in a normal Roxy or a Ritzy or anything. We're actually at a rave at the Eclipse in Coventry. And this is Energy Night. We've got live music tonight, exclusive, and it's all hot. Three tracks from Alternate, also an exclusive from Sunscreen. It is so hot in here, it's unbelievable. Oh. So here, what's happened to Pete Waterman is that his world has collapsed around him. He's lost control of a nightclub. There's been a coup. Here, the king of the producers has been deposed. This is a 41, 42-year-old man making music for, like, 13, 14-year-olds. So in a way, he has no connection to that culture. What you're seeing here is a real generation gap. These photographs show a part of the gay club scene in Chicago in the mid-1980s. 
Ron Hardy was a producer and a DJ, and with his friends set up a club called The Music Box. And these are some of the pictures, they're very intimate, they're very loving photographs, if you think about the club as a haven. So the club is the place where you can be the person you want to be. Maybe the closest equivalent to the nightclub is the church, where people support each other and share common values. For me, these photographs are like the beginning of a new religion. So possibly the earliest Christian services were like this, illicit underground gatherings of people who were whipped up into a frenzy through music and sound. And the kind of music they were making, it's like a tougher version of disco, but less straight and less white. These pictures were taken in the midst of the AIDS epidemic. So this is actually a very terrifying time to be gay because it still wasn't totally understood by the public, at least. So there's a theory that these clubs and this music became popular because it was a way for men to spend time with each other without having to have sex. And so a lot of the songs are about working your body, working hard, all those kinds of things, as if this is like a job almost. But like any scene, this moves on. And this is when it goes from being in this little club to like bigger clubs. It's still black, but it's more heterosexual. It's a music scene that actually is making people money now. And this is from, I think, 86, about that. Part of the most recent contribution to the American music scene is how it got its name. So-called house music was first made in the creator's houses, but it was also performed at clubs called the Warehouse and Powerhouse. However it got its name, it's one of the hottest things going, and as Jay Levine reports, it may only be a matter of time before house musicians become heroes in their own home. <laughs> They started playing house music at this Michigan Avenue hotel and health club last summer, and they've been packing them in ever since. It's the first time house has escaped the south side dance clubs or north side juice bars for a more upscale audience, though it's still a long way from sweeping the city. Check, check, check. With Sweet D, Danny Wilson on keyboards, the DJ called Farley. Jackmaster Funk, one of the creators of house music, is ready to make a tape. It all starts with a heavy beat. Okay, that sounds pretty good. Now I'm going to talk into the sampler right here. Working hard and... and then we can play it from the keyboard. It stays into the sampler and I can play it on the keyboard up and down the scale. Work your body, work your body. It can have a fast or a slow effect. <laughs> Like the chipmunk, you know, or then I'll bring in the percussion. Our congas, low congas. So now with the bass line or drum beat set, the rhythm in place, and the vocal all recorded, Farley and Sweet D are ready to make what in the record business is known as a demo. What were you trying to do when you start? Make some money. House has been very good to Farley and to others. But if it takes off like many believe it will, those thousand dollar advances they've been getting may soon seem like peanuts. Jay Levine, Channel 7 Eyewitness News. The class which has the means of material production at its disposal has control at the same time over the means of mental production. There's a theory by Marx, a theory of alienation, which concerned the industrial worker's separation from what he or she was producing. This led to a separation from society and ultimately other human beings. So Marx thought that the only way for the worker not to be alienated was to take control of the means of production. Even though Karl Marx wouldn't have really understood house music, I think he would have understood what these people are doing, that they're taking control of the means of production, basically, and making something for themselves, and also something that can make them money. Technology has to progress, and by technology progressing, it changes people's relationships to each other, which is definitely what was happening here. Men make their own history, but they do not make it as they please. They do not make it under self-selected circumstances, but under circumstances existing already, given and transmitted from the past. Tradition of all degeneration weighs like a nightmare on the brains of the living. So this is the Roland 303. It was originally made to accompany guitarists, but as a product it was a failure. 
as it was so difficult to use and unruly. Uh, but in the hands of DJs and dance music producers, it made music that people had never heard before. And forms the basis of a lot of the music you'll hear today. There's another scene going on almost at the same time in Detroit. This is a city that has a landscape of ruins, effectively. It's a city that was known for the automobile industry, which was in the center of the town, more or less, and then moved out to the suburbs. So the center of town, for that reason and for others, became abandoned. In a way, it's the first city in the world to be post-industrial. It's a view of the future, but it's the future that's in ruins, effectively. It's the emptiness in the city that puts the wholeness in the music. It's like a blind person can smell and touch and sense things that a person with eyes would never notice. And I tend to think that a lot of us here in Detroit have been blind, blinded by what was happening around us. And we sort of took those other senses and enhanced them. And that's how the music developed. So you have this different musical environment, but also an environment of industry and technology and the tension between them. Barry Gordy built the Motown sound on the same principles as the conveyor belt system at Ford's. Today they use robots and computers to make the cars. I'm probably more interested in Ford's robots than Barry Gordy's music. I find this interesting here, the relationship between man and machine. A sort of robot working with a man. Also, another thing about Detroit, which is unusual in America, is that the union was very powerful, of auto workers. Not only was it very powerful, but it was desegregated. As with the radio stations, because Detroit was used as a testing ground for new musical formats. So the listening public were exposed to varied styles of music, including European electronic pop. The most important band, though, really, without doubt, are Kraftwerk, or a German band who made electronic music in the 70s and 80s. We should think of them as prophets rather than musicians, because they predicted the world we live in now and wrote songs about it. The band toured America in 1981, which would have been a transformative experience for the audience and the band. For me, this image is like a contemporary history painting. It's Europe saying hello to America, basically. So, you know, we have that idea of uh, handing on something, almost handing the means of production on to someone. But just to show how, how appreciated this music was and how unexpected it was in terms of how people reacted to it, this is footage on a TV show in Detroit. <laughs>
this is what makes the world turn around in terms of arts and culture. They're taking ownership of craft work in the way that craft work would have been thrilled about. It's the kind of thing when I feel a bit down, that's what I watch on YouTube. I'm happy that I, I live on a planet where that happened once. That's what I've been doing. So what we find is when this music comes to the United Kingdom, it doesn't just go to London. In fact, London isn't the main place for it. It's spread through black communities in the UK, often through sound systems. So it becomes a national story. And obviously, places like Manchester are very important in that story. And Anthony Stevens ran such a sound system, and he's going to talk about it now. There was high unemployment in Manchester, the South Central Manchester in particular. But at the bottom of the ladder was young, single black males. Jobs were near enough impossible for people like me to come by. Many of us just made money on the street any which way we could. But underneath it all was always our love of music. Being Jamaican, my parents obviously raised me on reggae music, so that's what I listened to as a child. When my parents first came here, they were welcome into white pubs and clubs. So it kind of made sense as to why we were always having house parties where somebody would basically turn their house into a club for a weekend. If we wanted to have our own events, we had to go to local community centres or local gyms or school halls or whatever, basically because we weren't welcome in the city centre. They didn't have music systems in there, so you'd have to bring your own in order to put an event on. Sound systems were the single most important thing for black music in the UK. I first started off in a sound system called Youth Man Promotion and I absolutely just was spellbound by the whole culture of it. The big boxes, the booming bass, dreadlocks, ganja smoking, oh, I just absolutely loved it. You'd find that there were sound systems that were kind of allied to a certain street or a specific area or a postcode or whatever. And all the young boys in that area, even the girls as well, that was their identity, whether they were directly involved in it or not, they were all part of this big sound system. This was Mossside Library. It was a nice big space. It was in the hood and it was available to us. What you can see at the Mastermind Roadshow here is essentially what we had to do. Basically, a follow-up from our parents from the 50s to 60s. This is in the 80s. We had to go and find a space somewhere where we were accepted. We then had to go and bring our own machines in there, our own music, and then create our own entertainment. Because if we didn't, we'd have had nothing else to do. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. 
people think house music got invented in 88 is because white people got on it. They were hearing about this music that young black kids were playing in the hood. You know, there was no real kind of white underground culture. There was really nothing there for young white kids to kind of get their teeth into. If you want to get on something, this house music was absolutely perfect. This is the testimony of Charlie, this young woman that, that ran clubs. She was 19 when she started organising them, and she's talking about the scene in the south of England. This is the moment that the music went from being underground to overground, as Anthony described earlier. We were Milton Keynes kids. We used to go to this nightclub called The Point in Milton Keynes, and uh, it was terrible, dreadful music, uh, glittery outfits. And then somebody told us about this club in London called Shum, who we went down there and we just, it was this tiny little club, um, probably held 150 people, and it was at a fitness centre in Southwark in South London. I've never seen anything like it. It was tiny, it was boiling hot. I mean, everyone was really friendly. People were just wearing tie-dye clothes or trainers, and there was no pretension. And we had the absolute time of our life, and we were like, this is it. The trouble was, Shum was so hard to get into, and so um, we decided to do our own little party. started off with 50 people and then the next week we did one that was bigger and then we just kept outgrowing different venues because you know you go to something that's that amazing you just want to take everyone that you like and you want to give them the best night of their life. When the government tried to change the law, they brought in the Graham Bright bill. Graham Bright wanted to make it so it was illegal to put on a party. You had to have a licence, and if you didn't have a licence, you would get 20 grand fine and six months in prison. And obviously, they were never, ever going to give us a licence. We had our Freedom to Party campaign. We all met at Trafalgar Square. There were 10,000 people, which was pretty good because it was absolutely lagging down with rain. We were fighting for our right to dance. watching each other, how like we have technology so if we were to see someone dance or do something a bit different, we'd instantly record them. But there, there's no technology, no nothing, so they're just in their own space. Whereas it's a bit more controlled now, I think. Charlie, you just heard, came in for a lot of criticism at the time and still does. I actually think she did a great thing by popularising these parties. She didn't keep it just for a group of people in the know. She made it popular and made it available to many, many more people. And I think that's when things become interesting, when something that's initially very small explodes onto the scene, and then it becomes a movement. In the south of England, the mental and physical infrastructure was in place for these parties to grow and grow. 
The M25 was conveniently finished in 1986 and became the nocturnal gateway for these invasions of the home counties. Less conveniently, though, these were also the constituencies of many Conservative MPs. I brought with me some flyers, which I'd like to sort of hand out to people and maybe get your reactions to them. If you want to, like, look at some of those, pass a few down. The flyers were full of promises of these mythical events, often a strange mix of arcane imagery and the new language of technology. It related to the past, present and future, but also there's a lot of information on them and that gave all these details about what was happening, things that you might not have understood but were still kind of uh, enticing. It was as if the future was about to arrive in one of these fields. I would never see anything like this nowadays. Really? Like, what, like, why? I feel like on on posts, like on lampposts and stuff, you know, when they stick down like old things like that. Yeah. But I feel like that was like from long, long ago. But like nowadays, I've never seen anything like this. Is it confused? I don't even understand what it yeah, is. Yeah, what, what don't you understand? Is it a concert? Is it a... I don't know what it is. It's a big party, basically. It's not really a concert. But it has all these things going on. Yeah. It has to be a big crowd for it to be three arenas. These parties took the authorities by surprise, and they were the first large scale mobilization of people since the miners' strike. But this was for social reasons, not political. The threat they saw was from young people, and it was also a threat from something they didn't really understand. Now we can see this as a glimpse of a digital future which we take for granted. So very quickly, it becomes something that is on the news a lot and becomes one of these new social panics. All night acid house parties have become a major craze in little over two years. Held in disused warehouses, derelict barns, even old airfields, they've multiplied, with often more than 10,000 young people gathering at locations kept secret to the last moment. The illegal parties, with tickets costing up to £30, have led to running battles with police, a barrage of complaints over noise levels, drug abuse, and concern over inadequate safety and fire precautions. Despite a thinly attended debate, there's all party support for Tory backbencher Graham Bright's bill to increase the penalties for organising unlicensed parties. More acid house parties means more aggravation for local communities, more risk of a major accident to those attending. And that is a matter I hope we never have to debate yeah, in this yeah, house. Yeah, yeah. Government ministers support the bill. And I don't think it's uh, stuffy or boring to tell young people to watch it. Not just to watch it over being ripped off by these unscrupulous operators who charge large sums of money for parties that don't happen, but also watch it because you may be being lured into a building where if something goes wrong, it could be turned into a fire trap. But supporters of acid house parties say it's a mistake to drive the movement further underground. Like prohibition in the States in the 1920s, when you put legal companies, professional production companies out of business, the only people left to take it over will be criminals. That is the main danger. And I see this situation developing where there are people who are now coming into contact with organized crime because professional companies won't be able to do this legally. This person who is involved in the party scene is called Paul Staines and he has a big role in British life now and he had a big role before this party scene as well. He worked for a guy called David Hart and David Hart was a big supporter of Margaret Thatcher and he had a room at the Ritz Hotel in London where he had thousands of pounds in cash which he would put into envelopes and it would be taken all around Britain to pay men to go back to work during the strike, causing great division within the mining community. Now, Paul Staines runs this website. It's called Guido Fawkes. It's a right-wing website that sort of trades in gossip and stories about politicians. Paul Staines is an agent of chaos. He is a very clever operator, very sort of intelligent, dangerous person in British society. And he got involved in the party scene, not just because he was really into the music, but he could see it as a way of creating sort of chaos around Britain and uncertainty and so on. Do you know the miners' strike? Was it for environmental reasons or was it just purely like economic? That's a really good question. 
Yes, it was about economics, but also it was an ideological question because the government was determined to break the power of organised labour in Britain. It wasn't really about the environment, especially when you think about it, when the people that were actually wanting to stop coal production are people that now probably would be deniers of climate change as well. You can't understand the 80s without considering the miners' strike. The whole decade sort of pivots on the strike. The strike happens in the middle of the decade. And really everything that leads up from 1980 to the strike is a build-up to this confrontation. And everything after it is really people trying to deal with that. During the strike, a parallel welfare state was set up with the support of the public because the government withdrew benefits for the miners. Food banks were very common. The idea of communal Britain, this post-war idea of Britain as a place where you had an agreement with the state effectively, was, was ending. was seen in the public during the minor strike, so was it just the working um, class that were against Margaret Thatcher, or was it also maybe middle class? People were very unsettled by what we were seeing in Britain. It was like the country was being ripped apart. I mean, we're in a kind of similar position now, similar situation, but without the violence, thankfully, in terms of ideas and ideologies. And the fact that both leaders on both sides of the strike Arthur Scargill and Margaret Thatcher were basically both totally stubborn in their position. And there was no real way of negotiation between them. And I think people looked ahead, they looked beyond the strike and realised that the legacy of it was going to be massive. And we're still living within that. A lot of the areas that voted for Brexit are these former air mining areas, which were, well, they were kind of socialist areas. But people became very embittered afterwards because they were abandoned. And so their politics hardened. I just wanted to ask um, what the link is between the minor strike and the music and the change in music. As a human being, you cannot be a, not affected by what happens around you. So if you, for a whole year, you're watching that kind of thing on TV and it's upsetting you, it will change you. But it's just, a, it, it's just an idea I have about it. But it infected, really, the minor strike infected the rest of the 80s. <laughs> So this is Manchester during the Industrial Revolution. And in post-industrial Britain, you have all these spaces that are empty and that are ready for something else. And in Blackburn, there were parties which were very different. They weren't as expensive to get into, and they were using factories and places where people had worked until very recently. In the Industrial Revolution, you'd have been in a building with very, very noisy machinery, very hot, and quite dangerous. And then within a generation, people are paying to go into these buildings to socialize and to be deafened by choice. So you're basically sort of dancing in these places where your ancestors maybe worked. 
These parties are nothing less than a death ritual to mark the transition of Britain from an industrial to a service economy. In the north, just like in the south, it became hugely controversial. Well, tonight we're coming live from a warehouse somewhere in Lancashire. The locations are secret because we're talking about warehouse parties. As Lancashire sleeps, or tries to, thousands of young people descend on empty warehouses and dance. Drug dens, sex parlors, death traps. <laughs> These parties have been called almost everything, but what exactly goes on? How much do you know about what happens at acid house parties? Quite a lot. It's been a nuisance, really, for months on end. Have you ever been to one, though? No, I, I wouldn't step foot inside one. You're here from the National Council for Civil Liberties. The main thing I'm concerned about is the policing of these parties, which is excessive and, in fact, is adding to the dangers. If the police are involved, it reminds me... When roadblocks... I'm from the National Council for Civil Liberties and we believe in the rights of people for freedom of assembly. The roadblocks that are set up to try and stop youth from going to parties reminds me of the miners' strike. Upfront's cameras recorded one remarkable night in Lancashire. <laughs> Day has been turned into night, so the rush hour is now at night time. So the whole idea about work and pleasure has been inverted. In 1984 or 1985, someone's dad would have been stopped going to a picket somewhere. But in 1988, the destination was pleasure, not the picket line. It was just interesting to see the police and state's response to music that they think was different. Yeah. I think it comes to the sense of when the state thinks that we're doing something that goes against the linear route, which they think we need in order to progress and become adults, then they just see it as a threat. And I think they used music as a good scapegoat to blame many of the problems that they were faced with in the time, so it's probably easier to blame it on the music when trying to see a reason for why there has been an increase in the drug culture than it is to actually go to the root of the problems at the beginning. I would just interesting to see that it's the same issue that we're dealing with as well. For some people, the drugs were an important part of the scene. It helped them get close to the music, but also helped them get close to other people. But the drugs contained within them the seeds of the destruction, because it meant that the police became interested in these parties, but also criminal gangs. These two opposing forces squeezed the scene. Britain industrialised very quickly. By 1850 or thereabouts, half the population of Britain lived in cities. We lost our connection to the countryside. When I go to the countryside, I don't really know what to do. You're in this, you know, this lovely place, but I don't know if I'm allowed to walk across a field or go along a path. I always think I'm going to get shouted at by someone, like a farmer or something. Who here goes to the countryside ever or much? I mean, who here thinks of themselves as British? Yes. Um, I see myself more as a Londoner because I feel as though London's quite different to the UK. I feel as though London is like more of an accepting place, but I feel as though if we did go outside of London, it's, it's still quite harsh if we did, especially minorities. So I feel like London's quite a different place and it's quite like a bubble, mm. like where cultures just accept each other. Have you, have you travelled outside London much? Yeah, I have. Where have you been to? Um, Oxford. How was that? I felt out of place because obviously there's m much more white people there. Um, weird looks and 
maybe because they haven't seen someone like me that that much but it wasn't that I felt scared it was just the looks that's like irritating because we forget that in London people are used to it so when you go to those places you f you're, you're we're shocked as well not just them they're shocked to see people like me but I'm also shocked to see people like me <laughs> L loads of them <laughs> typically people go into cities to socialize but during this time, people were leaving cities to go into the countryside to do that. For me, rave offers up profound imagery like this, which really messes with our national identity. But for me, that's a really interesting sort of look at Britain. Britain old and Britain new at the same time. This dancing and then in front of a sort of 500-year-old stately home. The British countryside is an uncontrollable place, which has never been tamed, despite the Victorians' best efforts to Christianise their traditions, which are based around order being inverted. So about danger and chaos. There's a connection to the deep past in these events, and these parties also tapped into this pre-Christian chaotic world. The British countryside has always been a site of conflict throughout history, and this was no less the case in the 1980s, where ideological battles were being fought in fields. Hunt saboteurs were disrupting the class system and animal cruelty. Road protesters were occupying building sites and land. And the women of Greenham Common were picketing an American nuclear weapons site. These groups lived on the fringes of mainstream society. Nomadic convoys of vehicles were formed, and they became known in the media as New Age travellers. Not surprisingly, the authorities saw them as nothing but a nuisance. The convoys were constantly on the move, like a tribe that's trying to find a home and can't, because they're not being allowed to. Once a year, they took a pilgrimage to Stonehenge to celebrate summer solstice. From the mid-80s onwards, they were prevented in this quest, and so Stonehenge became a huge pressure point the tension is building in the countryside and people are being frustrated and their civil liberties as they see them are being stopped as this documentary from 1986 shows. At midday, more than 300 people leave the camp and make their way onto the A36 in the direction of Stonehenge. At this stage, they still don't know how far the police will allow them to go. About five miles from Stonehenge, the convoy is stopped in its tracks. Waiting in the middle of a dual carriageway is a force of several hundred police. This is a police announcement. Hey. Hey. Stay here, let's get some guitars, let's have a party. Yeah. What law is there in the country to stop us from going to an ancient monument, the religious? A place of worship does mean. 1936! Get this stuff cleared up as quickly as possible. Yeah. Hurry up, you've got ten minutes, OK. I was supposed to meet somebody at the last Festival of Peace and Understanding, um, and they didn't turn up. Picture. Here I am, and so this is all you, I've got. I'm a refugee. <laughs> I'm what? an exile in my own country now. Yeah. I'm going to apply for the refugee status to the British Refugee Council. I used to work with refugees, and this is what happened to people in third world countries. This is what happened to people in Latin America. This is the new right taking over. And that's serious. Yeah. Yeah.
20 seconds these people appear on the screen. And I just want to ask if anyone would be able to predict what they're going to say about the young people. They aren't going to like it, because it's different. And um, they're just going to think that they're just disrupting everyone, and maybe because it's not their way of living, so they won't agree with it. South Africa, aren't they? But well, we've got a better there, apartheid yeah. out there with the blacks. Well, we got it with our own people. We're, we're just, just as bad as this is a police state now. That's what it is. Here, we got no freedom of speech, and you got no freedom in this country now. I don't want no bugger hustling me or chasing me about, telling me what I can't do and what I can do. It's a free country. Everybody do what you please. But they can't just have freedom just because they want it. They have to contribute something to society. Doing something for their country. Lying over there, drinking, smoking. What did they... Who paid for it? They're tired. Oh, the poor thing. So am I tired going to work and bringing up three children. I'm tired. Draining my tiredness in drugs and alcohol. They're not got drugs. They've not got drugs. Can you prove they've got drugs? Can you prove they've got drugs? No, Go I over. can't. But I can see them with their cans of beer and their cigarettes and everything. They're entitled to have a beer. Don't you have a glass of beer? We all drink. I have a glass of beer. Doesn't matter where the money came from. They want a drink. So they're having a drink. And if they wanted a bloody drink, I'd give them the money to give them a drink. Go on, then. Give them your money. They're I'd not having them. mine. I willingly give it to them. I'll share what I've got with anybody. He can be the tramp in the street. It doesn't bother me. He's as good as I am, until proved different. You're very brave to say that, because I would, I would have said the same thing. You'd expect someone of that age, and that other man as well, to be anti it. But those men fought in the war, probably. You know, they would have grown up and been very aware in the 1930s what happened to people in certain countries if they didn't conform. This is a year after the strike, and I think people probably had enough by then of what the strike had done to, to the country. Did you hear that part where the guy said, let's get some guitars and have a party? Yeah? I thought it was quite funny, because, of course, no one really gets a guitar anymore and has a party, do they? When techno sound systems joined the convoys, they transformed the traveller movement. This footage is shot by Sarah Sender, who was a part of Spiral Tribe, one of the most famous sound systems that travelled with the convoys. The music was a switch that activated the wider public so the sound systems became modern-day Pied Pipers, effectively. Techno was really the perfect music for this scene, the travellers. Even though the music itself is, is instrumental mainly, it carried within it all the meaning of these movements, of the people that were there. And so when you were at these events, you realised you were in a very political environment. Castle Morton was the biggest gathering of sound systems and travellers and, and ravers, basically, that had happened in Britain. It was over a bank holiday weekend and up to 40,000 people attended. It's become a mythical event in dance music history and culture. The name even sounds like a battle from the English Civil War. Subsequently, laws were brought in to make sure that something like this could never happen again. After Castle Morton, uh, members of Spiral Tribe were arrested, and having been exiled once from the cities to the countryside, they left Britain and they ended up in Berlin, surrounded by the detritus of the Cold War. So do you identify with these people, what you're seeing here, these young people? Not personally. Um, I guess it's just the party lifestyle. Um, sort of going against um, authority and the idea of having so much scrutiny on me and my peers, you know, yeah. You wouldn't like that? It's just, it's just a lot of pressure to, to act in a certain way. And I feel like um, unconsciously we all sort of just conform 
yeah especially in this day and age you know maybe back in the 80s it was a bit different there's a lot more ways i feel nowadays to to like get status we have social media as well because in a way that's more important now than music is pop music is the dominant art form of the late 20th century but now it's not as important as social media seems to be the most important thing in people's lives yeah Shelley's laser dome, Stoke on Trent. We're now room Swindon. The Arches, Glasgow. Monroe's Great Harwood. Metro at Saltcoats. Yeah, yeah. Essence, Swansea. Eclipse, Coventry. Quadrant Park, Liverpool. Hangar 13 Air. Evolution Hall. Madison's Bournemouth. Yeah, yeah. Stearns Worthing. Quest Wolverhampton. Two Club Birmingham. Gold Diggers Chippenham. Yeah, yeah. Milwaukee's Bedford. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hacienda, Manchester. Yeah, yeah. Sanctuary, Milton Keynes. Yeah, yeah. Shabu, Blackpool. Bari Stroud. Turnmills, London. Yeah. <laughs> in the early 90s, the image of towns and cities in Britain changed because of rave clubs. They were these mythical places where people went and had these amazing nights. And that was something I found very interesting. And so for a time, Britain was almost redefined by this music, which was articulating the changes in society from going from being industrial to digital. And these clubs make us think differently about these places. Who had Laser Dome in Stoke-on-Trent? You had it, yeah. That's what we're going to look at. And this, in a way, it's very typical of the clubs at the time. I've watched this, I've been watching this for like the last week, you know, obsessively watching it again and again and again. There's footage of these young people that just kind of breaks my heart almost. I love it. There's something very heroic about living in the moment like this and going out and being in a club and being at one with all the people around you and sort of living it. But in a way, it's going back to this. I see that and this club is a, you know, it's a similar thing. It's about feeling part of something. And I think that's what those clubs did for people. Because uh, let's face it, at this point in history, in Britain, people had a very uncertain future. And yet these clubs were incredibly popular, probably because of that. Unlike the travelers, and this is all about the same time, there isn't much politics here in, in a traditional sense. It's really just about enjoyment. And it's just pure pleasure and energy. Stephen Wiseman, best thing about this video, not a mobile phone in sight. Everyone absolutely loving it. Awesome. James S. Glad I did this in my youth rather than my face glued to social media. Stereo Voyage. Real rave club scene. No judgment, whatever clothing style. Alone or accompanied. No stupid phones, only smile and dancing. 
Christopher James, if you were there in that time, we didn't really appreciate it. I can remember two summers, 92 to 94, that were literally perfect. No grief, just carefree and happy. Neville Watson, I loved the anarchy of those early parties. It was as if all those years were spent trying to jack the system. Through things like punk and aggression had no effect, and then suddenly all these kids who'd never considered themselves political were creating this revolution. It was more punk than punk ever was.